Okay then. Hello folks out in science land. Oh, there's our attendees. Hello people. Um, I'm James Murray. I'm a, um, am I camera on? Yeah. Uh, I'm James Murray. Uh, I am a, a scientist at the California State University East Bay. Uh, and my primary bag is neuroscience. And uh, Ms. Yadagari. Hello all. Um, my name is Jennifer Yadagari. Um, I also teach uh, biology courses at CSU East Bay, and I also work as a chemist, and my expertise is in molecular biology and forensic science. Super. So, so welcome, uh, everyone, for coming. And um, I wanted to uh, encourage you uh, to ask questions. Uh, we've, we each have kind of a different expertise. Uh, like I said, I'm primarily a neuroscientist. Um, and, um, and so I'm happy to answer some questions about those types of things. And then the other thing that I was hoping to do is to show you a little bit about my research and a little bit about uh, what brain cells look like and a little bit about, um, uh, let's give you some, some live view at some close up uh, nerve cells so you can see what they look like. Uh, so that, that's my plan and um, but I think, I think Ms. Yadagari is going first. Alrighty. So um, I think we should just begin with uh, my forensic science presentation. All right. So if you have questions, just uh, feel free to interrupt or put them in the chat. Um, essentially, uh, forensic science in general is a way for science and scientific knowledge and scientific methods in order to assist law in order to aid in um, solving criminal investigations. So there's many different types of evidence that can be collected. Um, and one type is blood. So something important that you should know about blood is that it is a fluid connective tissue uh, found within our bodies and that it has many components, uh, which you may already know about. Um, so blood, um, once it is centrifuged or spun, it can have various components. So the, this, is, uh, this layer contains urethrocytes. These are just red blood cells. Um, and then we also have leukocytes or uh, white blood cells. And we have uh, significantly lesser amounts of uh, white blood cells. And then there's also plasma. And we do have blood clotting factors uh, called platelets. So blood can be fine for uh, evidence collection. However, because red blood cells do not have nuclei, there is no DNA there to isolate, right? So essentially, uh, white blood cells are really good for um, isolating DNA, um, as is skin, skin cells, and um, bodily fluids. So to build upon that, um, DNA is um, incredible in, in terms of uh, using it as a a form of evidence for criminal investigations, um, but DNA does begin with isolation. So you need to collect the DNA sample, whether that be blood, skin cells, tissue, and then use a kit, as you see here, in order to isolate the actual helix, the actual DNA helices in that sample. Um, once, we, once we do isolation for DNA, we can go ahead and run a process known as PCR, in which we use our isolated DNA and we mix in some other uh, components, some other uh, ingredients, if you will. Uh, these include a, a mix, a master mix that we purchase, um, as well as primers that we purchase and uh, ultra pure water. Uh, once we have these and the DNA mixed, we put them into this machine and it will make, it will start out with like 10 helices and make billions. And this will allow us to visualize the DNA in an agarose gel. And this is um, another technique used in molecular biology as well as in forensic science. So here um, you can pipette out your amplified DNA into the gel, um, stain the, run the gel, stain the gel, and then put the gel into this large machine that you see here, the ChemiDoc, and it will generate a photograph. So it's almost like a very expensive camera. Um, the photograph looks something like this. These are two different gels. Um, these are these single bands right here. These are basically DNA bands that have shown up. They've been stained um, because there is a lot of DNA there because the PCR process was quite effective. Uh, no questions so far? Uh, 
I am taking some answers. In the okay, chat. great. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Murray. Okay, so um, after agarose gel electrophoresis, um, one of the final um, processes we utilize is DNA sequencing, and this helps us pull out the actual, the letters that code for our DNA. So um, the A's, C's, T's, and G's, um, and adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, these make up our DNA helix. Um, so sequencing, a sequencing machine is something we do use in order to, um, we take that PCR product, we clean it up, and then we put it into this machine and it gives us what you see here, which is our uh, genomic DNA. Or you could also sequence your mitochondrial DNA found in your mitochondria. Um, just another method um, that can be used in, in addition or regardless if you sequence or not, you can pull up a fingerprint. And the protocol is a little bit different, but you can still use a sequencing machine to pull up a DNA fingerprint. And this DNA fingerprint is much different than the prints on our fingers, right? Um, and then other pieces of evidence, these include um, document analyses. So you can take a document that was found at a crime scene, um, much like the one on the left. So this was from a ransom note from a very popular case. And then you can have a suspect come in and give a writing sample. And so the longer the, the ransom note is, the harder it is for the suspect to hide um, similarities. So you'll see here, this is a very long sample that the suspect wrote out, and you can still see a lot of similarities. So document analysis is another great method um, in terms of evidence. And then there's also fibers. Um, you can collect fibers from a crime scene. Um, you can look at them under microscopes. I have two microscopes here. Um, the one on the left is called a compound microscope or compound scope, and the one on the right is a dissecting scope. It's also called a stereoscope, um, but these are two types and these are excellent um, for viewing specimens and fibers. And then um, there's also fingerprinting, right? The fingerprints that we have on our hands, on our fingers, um, and these are called latent prints. And there are jobs where the basic function of that of that position is to just pull latent prints off of um, pieces of evidence. So it's very, it's very complicated, this field, but essentially you have three different types of prints. So you can have loops, whorls, or arches um, on yours. And you can actually go on YouTube and figure out how to do a very basic latent print. You can take your own prints using paper and pencil. So that's one type of evidence. Another type is footprints. Um, and then there are also many different jobs that you can do um, if you're interested in the field of forensic science. Um, so there's, of course, there's being a molecular biologist, right? Just isolating DNA, running it out, amplifying it. But there's also forensic entomology. And this job relates to collecting specimens, specifically insects that are found at crime scenes. And you study their life cycle. And this helps you to uh, kind of gauge how long um, bones were at a crime scene location. So that's a forensic entomologist. We also have a forensic pathologist, which is um, almost similar to a coroner, um, but essentially um, forensic pathologists uh, conduct autopsies in order to uh, find cause of death. And then there's a forensic toxicologist. Uh, toxicologist runs um, various tests and using the scientific method in order to determine um, trace amounts of chemicals that were found in body fluids, that can be blood, that can be fluid inside the eye, that can be just other fluids in the body. Um, forensic toxicologists use various different assays, but specifically they use ELISAs and they also use uh, chromatography. That might be like high performance liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, mass spec, and there's other forms of chromatography. Um, and then there's various career choices. I have some just listed here. Uh, these are um, this is current in the Bay Area. This can include being a criminalist, a technician, an investigator, um, someone who takes latent prints, or even a forensic pathologist. Um, and I do want to mention forensic pathology does require medical school, but um, to be a coroner, which is very similar, does not require medical school. And then I also have the coursework. Uh, if you are interested in, the, in pursuing this field, there's not that much coursework involved. Um, you would just take um, a few years of uh, biology, a few years of chemistry and organic chemistry, uh, physics, and some math, and, um, and some upper division coursework in criminal justice. Um, so that is all for my presentation on forensic science. Um, I can take questions if you have them.
There is a question, and I'll read it to you. Uh, was there any final determination on the Ramsey killer? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I've, I have researched that case quite a lot. Um, the final determination they made about 15 years ago was that they um, exonerated the parents and the family. So the Patsy Ramsey, John Ramsey, and the brother, they were exonerated. Um, and I said it was just touch DNA exonerated them. Um, but there has been, I think that case is actually still open. Um, so you can do a lot of research. A lot of people don't really agree with the exoneration of that family, um, but some people do. And there are many books you can find like on Amazon that the investigators of that case have written um, that tells a lot about that story. Um, someone else is asking about cold cases. Can you elaborate? What does PCR stand for? It stands for uh, polymerase chain reaction. It's a chain reaction. Once we add the DNA and the primers and all those ingredients, we heat it into a, in a machine. It's called a PCR machine. Um, and it heats and cools and it, it pulls, to, pulls off the strands of the helix and then it makes two strands and then that makes four and that makes eight and that makes billions. Um, what about cold cases? Cold cases remain cold unless there's a break in the case, unless an investigator um, opens that case and decides to investigate it more, or sometimes cold cases, they can find um, bones or other things, it, investigative leads that help them solve it, but sometimes cold cases remain cold, like hey, the Ramsey can, case. Can I interject something, Riff? Yes. Who is the Golden State killer who was found not with like, I mean, they were found because people had volunteered their DNA to a DNA sequencing company, relatives, distant relatives, and then they found a match to the perp that was similar but not identical to the relatives, and that helped them find that guy. Isn't that right? Yes. Gotcha, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can, you can amplify quite a bit. Yeah. There's a lot of questions. Um. <laughs> I, I've answered most of them. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, Thank I'm you. I'm going to scroll back. I was typing some answers earlier. Someone asks, why do you need to create new strands? Um, because maybe in your original sample from the tissue or the saliva sample, maybe you have only 10 DNA helices, maybe you have 100. That's sadly not enough to, to see it on a gel. So if you don't have a band on a gel, you have to go back and redo your PCR. If that doesn't work, you have to redo your isolation. What does DNA stand for? Deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a big word, but it's not that bad of a field. It's a very interesting field. <laughs> and then RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, Jim can take it over. Okie dokie. Hello, hello. Uh, like I said, I am a neuroscientist. And, and one thing that I do uh, every year, oops, I got to share my screen. Let me do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's see here, paying attention. There I am. Okay, one thing I wanted to show you there is uh, every year uh, our university sponsors the uh, Bay Area Brain Bee. And uh, it's kind of like a, a spelling bee, except all the questions are about brain and nervous system. Uh, we're not sure we're going to be able to hold an actual brain bee competition this year because of the pandemic and everything. Uh, should watch this space, uh, Bay Area Brain Bee Weebly uh, Watch that space because uh, we're definitely going to have some sort of event, uh, and it, and it should be a fun event. So I'm um, hoping you can. Uh, uh, perhaps sit in on something like that. It is, uh, it's actually, we've got, some, we've got some, some ideas that might be actually pretty fun. So uh, what I'd also like to show you here, if I may, is a little bit about my research. And I am struggling to find it. There she is. Okay. Um, okay. So let me maximize that. Okay, everybody can see that? 
Oh, I know what I want to do. Before I tell you about, about uh, my research, I want to ask you guys a question, okay? And, and so uh, I'd like you all to uh, get into the chat, if you don't mind, uh, go to the chat, and I want you to type your answer in there, but don't press return, okay? So the question, and don't, don't, don't press return, but you can type your answer. The question is, uh, like the price is right, uh, give me a number, but don't go over. How many brain cells are there in a human brain? Okay, Price is Right rules, don't go over. Okay, so, so uh, I'm going to give a count of five. I'm going to count down from five. And when I go to zero, you can press return. Okay, so put in a number, a guess about how many brain cells there are in the human brain without going over. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one, go. No guesses or you're still thinking? They're in the chat. Oh, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see it because uh, I'm, I'm not scrolling down. There we go. Okay, I am now scrolling down and I see your answers. 90 million, uh, 300 million, 1 million, 100,000, 2,000, 100, billion trillion okay so this is good one person one person went over the person who went to a trillion is probably not correct uh oh yeah another person said three trillion so those are the only two answers that are probably over uh the one answer that that's a hundred billion is pretty darn good good guesstimate right no one's ever counted every single one of them right they're estimates based on extrapolations but a hundred billion is a pretty good guess um, and so the human brain is a complicated, humongous, uh, really complicated uh, organ. And so I'll show you a few pictures uh, of those um, a little bit later. But I wanted to show you a little bit about what I do in my research, which is pretty, pretty weird. Um, I study sea slugs. And, um, uh, and so this is a sea slug right here um, shown about life size. Uh, they are, are two handfuls of, of orange flesh uh, and they've got little sensory organs and, uh, and they're, they're mostly blind, oddly enough. Um, and what I'm interested in is how they use their brain to process information. Uh, and so like any animal, they have to go out in the world, they have to find food, they have to avoid predators, they have to find mates. Uh, and, and they navigate around with whatever sensory abilities they have. Um, and so they do have a good sense of touch, a good sense of smell, uh, and they can also sense tidal flow and, um, and then uh, magnetic reception. Uh, someone, Kimball, raised their hand. Do they have a question they'd like to unmute for? I'm not sure if I have to unmute you or if you can unmute you. And I saw a raised hand. I think I allowed him to, to unmute. Okay. But he needs, uh, Kimball uh, will need to unmute themselves. Well, well, jump on in if anybody has any questions. Uh, I'm happy to, to answer them as we go. And so what's really cool is this slug has a built-in magnetic compass. Uh, unlike humans, humans can't sense the Earth's magnetic field for really in any significant way. But these slugs can orient themselves to the magnetic field using their internal compass. But we don't know physiologically how that works. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to study in our lab. Um, the sea slug has a brain. And we just said a human brain has 100 billion neurons. Uh, the sea slug has on the order of 5,000. Not a smart animal. But with 5,000 brain cells, it can do all the things that animals need to do. It can find mates, it can avoid predators, it can find food. Uh, it, it, does, it gets along quite well with just 5,000 brain cells. The other thing that's cool about these brain cells is you actually can see them on this uh, photograph of its brain. Uh, it's got these kind of six or eight lobes of its brain. This is a whole brain cell by itself there. That's a whole brain cell. There's a little white one. Some of them are quite large. They are almost one millimeter wide. So they are macroscopic brain cells. You could see them with your naked eye if you squinted a little bit. Uh, so they have some of the largest cells uh, in the animal kingdom outside of eggs. Uh, and so it makes it 
easier for me to study their brain when they only have 5,000 brain cells and some of their brain cells are quite large. Uh, these uh, white cables here are the nerves extending out uh, from the brain. Uh, and so carrying sensory information in and motor commands out. And we've mapped out a lot of the brain, uh, brain uh, nerves. Uh, we know this is the olfactory nerve. We know that there's uh, an optic nerve. I said the animal's blind, but it does have a, a, an eye that physiologically seems to work, but we haven't seen any obvious response uh, when we shine lights in their eyes. So we think they're blind. Uh, and then they have nerves to send out motor commands and things like that. The other thing that's really interesting about this slug is you can uh, record from their brain cells, uh, making a little hole in their head, putting a little platform underneath their brain, sticking some uh, pins uh, around the brain to keep it from moving around. And then you can manipulate uh, electrodes into the brain cells and monitor the brain cells while the animal is behaving. Um, and so this is what it looks like in kind of diagrammatic form, uh, just a little cut hole, hole in their head and then uh, record from the brain cells and the animal behaves pretty normally. Uh, and so we've been able to figure out how the animals uh, navigate, how the animals escape predators, uh, all by monitoring their brain uh, while it's still attached to the animal. And then what this is showing here Oh, sorry, I should have tested that earlier. This is showing some uh, electrical recordings from the brain uh, showing individual pulses here. Each one of these pulses uh, are coming from a different brain cell. Uh, and so uh, I can record electrical activity coming out of the nerves, uh, record that information going into the nerves. And I can also uh, monitor, no, oh, there we go, I made another mistake there. Uh, I gotta fix that video for later. Uh, but I can also inject each one of these brain cells with a fluorescent chemical. And so uh, this part of the brain here has uh, hundreds of brain cells, and I've injected four of them with a fluorescent dye. Uh, this is the cell body, this is the axon, and these are all the dendrites extending off of it. And so you can imagine if there's this much complexity in one brain cell out of hundreds, in a sea slug, you can imagine how complex it gets with 100 billion brain cells uh, in a human brain, uh, which is why I don't work in, in human brains. It's too complicated. Okay, and um, yeah, so, so this shows you uh, some of those brain cells labeled with fluorescent chemicals, uh, and it just shows that some brain cells are quite small, some of them are quite large. Uh, these are the brain cells that have a chemical in them called sensorin that we think is involved with uh, uh, labeling sensory cells. Uh, and so this is actually these tiny, tiny cells here, these are about the same size as human brain cells. These little tiny ones here in the center. Okay, so human brain cells are a big pain in the neck. Vertebrate brain cells are a pain in the neck in general. Invertebrate brain cells can be very, very large. And so the other thing I can do is I can take one of those sensory nerves that I showed you before and, and dip that in the fluorescent chemical and the fluorescent chemical will get transported into the brain. And now I can see all the nerve cells that have an axon in that nerve that goes to the mustache that I showed you before, that oral veil. Uh, and so we've been poking around at these brain cells trying to figure out how the animal senses its environment. Okay, and again, you can look these, like I said, these teeny tiny cells here, these are about the size of a, of a human brain cell. Uh, and, and most of the nerve cells in the sea slug are considerably larger. Okay, and, and so uh, we showed you that sea slug earlier. This is a sea slug, he doesn't know, doesn't know it yet, but he's about to bump into a predator. I told you he's blind. Okay, there he goes. Uh, and so he bumped into the predator and he could taste the, what the species was. And that species is a very dangerous predator called a sunflower star. Sunflower stars will eat anything that doesn't eat them first. Uh, and, and so the slug tastes that and then engages in this flippity floppy behavior. Uh, this uh, flopping behavior is charitably called swimming. Uh, and 
because the brain is so simple, we've been able to figure out the neural circuit that, under, that uh, underlies that swimming behavior. Uh, and that has helped us to understand a lot about how rhythmic behavior is controlled in all sorts of animals. Yeah, I see still flopping around there. Um, and uh, so that's what the, what the slug looks like out in its natural habitat. Um, and they're, they're quite beautiful, interesting animals. We've made a lot of progress studying them. Um, so one thing I'm interested in is, is how they sense their environment. Uh, and this shows you little diagrams of all the little sensors they have on their skin. Uh, these are, are cilia that project out of their skin uh, for purposes of touching, uh, receiving touch, and chemical taste signals. Um, and so I've been doing some scanning electron microscopy. Uh, again, sometime when uh, uh, the pandemic is over, uh, we can invite you over to our university to use this um, uh, scanning electron microscope. Uh, the um, uh, Toshiba uh, Corporation donates uh, a microscope to various schools. And, and I would look into that for your own school uh, in the future if you are uh, interested in that. Uh, your teacher can have that uh, microscope delivered uh, to your, um, uh, your school. Okay, um, let's see here. I think, I think it's almost top of the hour. I think I'm going to uh, stop talking and, uh, and hand it over to Ms. Yadigari. Oh, and then are there any questions? There are. Great. I can read them out to you. So Megan asks, um, she mentions that there was once somebody who blended a brain into a homogenous, homogenous solution. And if that is possible to estimate the number of neurons in that brain? Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not too familiar with that technique. Um, but even if, yeah, I mean, these, these brain cells, right, they are um, huge, huge, complicated networks. So you saw that, that one back there. Um, you know, you might be able to count the nuclei maybe, uh, but there are these long, uh, stretchy neurons that have long axons and long dendrites. They'd, they'd probably fall apart uh, when you uh, blended them. Uh, so maybe you could count nuclei, uh, but, but I think uh, based on our extrapolations, most people think the human brain has 100 to maybe, maybe I think 80 billion up to 200 billion is what I've seen. So I think it's probably somewhere in there. And then do you know how many uh, brain cells horses have? No, but, but um, I would, if I had to guess for a, a typical mammal, um, it's definitely I, gonna be pushing billion. I, I found that cats have 300 million and dogs have 160 million, so horses would have way more than that. Probably, probably. You know, they, they, they do uh, add more neurons for larger bodies for the most part. And then another question from Megan is, what are the advantages of having macroscopic scales, assuming the uh, cells, assuming the cell in question isn't one of those motor neurons that goes from spinal cord to foot? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And, and um, uh, we have a, a, an interesting answer that we're not certain about, but um, <clears throat> you might have heard that in uh, vertebrates like ourselves, we have a chemical called myelin. Uh, and myelin is a type of insulating uh, material made out of supporting glial cells. And that myelin helps uh, facilitate uh, the propagation of action potentials. And in our axons, they can go much faster when the axon is, is uh, wrapped by myelin. So the interesting thing is myelin was invented uh, three or four times. Uh, the vertebrates, most, uh, a lot of vertebrates have it. Uh, most invertebrates don't. And so that means their action potentials travel slower. But there's another thing you can do for a neuron to make the action potential travel faster is make it wider. So if you have a narrow, narrow axon, it, it propagates slowly. If you make that axon wider, it propagates more quickly. And so the sea slugs seem to have made their axons wider. Now this, this axon here that I'm pointing at uh, yeah, I'm still sharing my screen, is probably close to 20 microns wide. 
which sounds small, but that's pretty big given the fact that this axon might extend the length of a 30 centimeter animal. And so you take 30 centimeters times 20 microns uh, and calculate the volume, that ends up being a lot of cytoplasm. And so if you want to uh, keep all that cytoplasm fed with mitochondria and, and energy and stuff like that, you have to run a lot of proteins. In order to make a lot of proteins, you have to have a lot of RNA. In order to have a lot of RNA, you gotta have a lot of DNA. And so this cell body here is almost all nucleus. It is almost all nucleus with a little rind of cytoplasm on the outside. And this nucleus has within it uh, 5,000 copies of the genome. And so uh, it seems that they need that many copies of their genome to make enough RNA, to make enough protein, to maintain that huge axon. And so in order to have an axon that is fast enough, it has to be wide. In order to keep it alive, you have to have a giant nucleus. Consequently, you have to have a giant cell. That's, that's the story we, we, we think it might explain it. Um, there are some more questions. Um, one question is, what is the average lifespan of a human neuron? I'd, I'd say the average has got to be very close to the average lifespan of a human. Almost all the brain cells that you uh, have when you're one, you're still going to have when you're 99. Uh, you do lose some brain volume as you get older. Uh, most of your brain cells uh, don't die. And most of your, uh, you, the number of brain cells that are born every year is smaller than the number of brain cells you lose every year. Uh, so, so the number of brain cells that are born in, in adults or even past age one is, is not huge. Uh, so I would say the average age of a brain cell is approximately the average, the actual age of the person. Uh, what's, what's really cool, though, is if you wanted to know who has more brain cells, you or a, a dumb newborn, uh, the dumb newborn has more brain cells than you. Uh, and, and so uh, newborns are born with too many brain cells, and then they lose those brain cells o over the subsequent months. Uh, and so... Uh, Babies are not dumb because they, they lack brain cells. They've got plenty of brain cells. They're just not wired up properly. A few more questions. Um, why don't invertebrates have myelin? Um, I, I'm guessing because they can get away with, with, with being this fast, right? You saw that behavior. That behavior was, was fast enough to get away from its predator. Uh, and, and so making those axons wide was making their behavior fast enough to deal with their behavior. Now, there are some invertebrates that do have it. And so uh, one of those examples are certain kinds of shrimp. And, and you may have seen the shrimp or the crayfish uh, escape response. You'd poke at them and they'd do that tail, tail, flipping, flip, 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 flip. And they move really, really quickly. That tail flip response is mediated by a myelinated uh, neuron. Uh, and so th it's not thought that 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 we, uh, in, uh, that we inherited their myelin in, in vertebrates is thought that myelin involved independently in those two different lines. So it's, it's been invented in a few critters, uh, presumably the ones that have to have super fast behavior. And then um, Carol is asking, how do neurons form? Yeah, so, so uh, like I said, it varies in, in different species, uh, but in humans, uh, you've got something like Two, I'm trying to look this up. And when you're when you're in utero, you are growing brain cells. Uh, yeah, 250,000 neurons per minute when you are in utero. That is crazy. And so they're basically popping off of um, stem cells. Okay, and and so those um, uh, stem cells are popping off new uh, neurons. This huge clip. Uh, and then those uh, cells that pop off have to then differentiate into that complicated branching uh, neuron. Uh, but, but before they differentiate into a neuron, first they have to actually crawl to the right place in the brain. Most of the brain cells are, are born uh, in the center of the brain, and then they have to migrate out to the edges. 
uh, and they essentially migrate out like an amoeba. Uh, so, so they're born from a stem cell, you know, a little spherical thing, turn into a little amoeba, crawl out to where they need to be, and then once they know where they need to be, then they differentiate into cell body, axon, dendrite. Uh, it's an amazing price. What, what was the question? <laughs> the question was how do neurons form? Okay, I, th I think I more or less got that, but, but um, you know, that last part is after they uh, go from sphere to amoeba, then they uh, differentiate into those long processes. And those long processes themselves uh, develop something on the tip of the axon called a growth cone. And that growth cone, again, acts like an amoeba. It puts out little pseudopods and tastes its way, tastes and smells its way to its target. Uh, and so that's a short answer to your question, I think. I think that covers it. Super duper. Yeah. You want to take over? Sure. Cool. Do I have to do anything? I think you have to stop uh, sharing. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next presentation I have um, is just basically outlining different phylums or phyla as seen in SpongeBob, um, a cartoon. Um, and so let me just turn off the chat. All right, so um, this is a very popular children's show, right? But, but it does contain all of these various animals, um, which are real animals, although they have, you know, character names. So I'm just going to begin with um, life on Earth, right? So there are three different domains um, on Earth. Um, so these are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Uh, eukaryotes are in euk eukarya in the, in the domain, um, but these are essentially cells that contain nuclei. Um, so I'm just going to focus on eukarya. Um, in this, in this domain, there are four kingdoms. Um, these are protists, fungi, animals, and plants. And so we're going to focus mostly on animals because all of the characters in SpongeBob are animals. Um, so the first character is SpongeBob. Um, SpongeBob is a sea sponge, and specifically in Eukarya, in the animal kingdom, in Animalia, uh, SpongeBob belongs to the phylum Porifera. So these are just sea sponges. Um, next, we have another <laughs> notable character, uh, Patrick. So Patrick is a sea star, as I've um, as I have written, and Patrick belongs also to Eukarya, also to Animalia, as these all do. Um, Patrick belongs to Echnodermata, which is a phylum in Animalia, and it is not just sea stars. It can include sea urchins, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, uh, and things like that. So um, it is important just to know in one phylum, you don't just have sea stars or sponges, you have lots of different animals. And that is specifically um, important when you get to mammalia, which is um, mammal, basically. Um, moving on uh, to Sandy. So Sandy is a squirrel. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to interrupt or put them in the chat. Um, Sandy is a chordate. So this squirrel belongs to chordata. And specifically, we have a lot of different types of chordates um, that do have uh, um, spinal columns or vertebrate animals. Um, specifically, a squirrel is within mammalia. Next, we have Squidward, an octopus. An octopuses do belong to the phylum mollusca. And like Dr. Murray was mentioning, the sea slug is also a mollusk. So it is from the phylum mollusca. Um, what is the phylum section, someone is asking. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have that, but I, there are different phylums. There's like 10 or 11. Some argue that there are more, um, but there are essentially like 10 famous phylas in um, Animalia. And there's different ones for plants. Um, so yeah, Squidward, just like a sea slug, is a mollusk. Um, and then we have Mr. Krabs. So this is a crab, and this is in the phylum Arthropoda. Um, what's interesting about arthropods, it's just not that they are all crabs or um, shellfish, but uh, arthropods can include insects, right? So also um, spiders, which are not insects, spiders are actually arachnids, but also arthropods. Um, but a subphylum, to know that this is a crab, it is crustacea. So Mr. Krabs is a crustacean, as are crabs, lobsters, 
and actually roly polies. Roly polies are not insects, um, but they are actually crustaceans. Um, specifically, yeah. So let's just move on to uh, Mrs. Puff. This is a puffer fish and also in Chordata, in the phylum Chordata, and the class is Actinoterygi, a longer name. And a lot of the fish do have very long names um, for their classes and their orders. Um, and then we have plankton. So this is a copepod. Um, the phylum is also Arthropoda, um, but the subphylum here is Crustacea, very similar to um, like lobsters and crabs. Um, and then we have, whoops, pearl, and pearl is a whale. So pearl belongs to chordata, a vertebrate, and specifically uh, mammalia. So pearl is a whale, so uh, she is a mammal. And we have different types of mammals, right? Different orders, uh, genera, and species. And then we have Gary, who is a mollusk, so in the phylum mollusca, but specifically gastropoda. Uh, this snail is a gastropod, as are land snails and sea snails, and also sea slugs, as you've heard, are mollusks. And then so that, that ends this presentation. And if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat or, or ask. I, can I, am I, am I? Yeah, you can hear me, right? Yes. Hey, I wanted to say something weird. Um, so, so, you know, most of the critters you talked about there are, are invertebrates. Uh, and, and I'm an invertebrate zoologist. And um, you might have heard, uh, probably not, but a couple years ago, there was a radio story that said, um, you know, we looked at different um, degrees that you could earn and then uh, found the average salary for that degree. And it's like, oh, well, that sounds good. You know, what are the, what are the, were the highest salaries? And they said, invertebrate zoology is one of the highest paying of all the degrees. And, and I'll tell you why that's wrong. It's, it's right, but it's wrong. And, and so, right, the implication you might have thought was, well, if I go into invertebrate zoology, I'm sure to make a lot of money. And, and um, that's not the case. The, the reason that invertebrate zoologists earn more money than other people's degrees is because invertebrate zoology is no longer taught. Um, can't get a degree in invertebrate zoology anymore. It's, it's, it's been subsumed into sort of integrative biology. And, um, uh, and so zoology is, is no longer a field that you can get a degree in. Um, but all the people who have that degree are old, right? And so the older people have moved up through the ranks and, and so they have high salaries by, by virtue of their oldness. So, so yeah, there's that. That's good to know. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so if anybody has any questions about invertebrate zoology, uh, I am an invertebrate zoologist and I have a degree in zoology. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to ask questions about that. I um, see one question, but it's, it's the myelin question. Megan says um, her wife, I failed. And then what is the answer to the question about why uh, invertebrates don't have myelin? Right, right. Um, you know, presumably most invertebrates don't require that amount of speed. Now, the other way of thinking about it, though, is is why did uh, vertebrates invent it? Now, one of the, like I told you, the sea slug has five thousand brain cells. If it makes its axons a little wider, it's just going to take up a little more space. Its brain is still only six millimeters wide. But what about a human brain? If a human brain didn't have myelin then each one of its axons would have to be uh, 10 times, maybe 50 times wider. If you make each one of the axons in your 100 billion brain cells wider, your brain is gonna be as big as a house. So, so essentially, vertebrates having myelin allows them to miniaturize their brain cells, but still keep them fast. Uh, and so why invertebrates don't need uh, that type of miniaturization is because they're getting along well enough with 5,000 brain cells. Now, people like to think of human brain as being normal, since we're humans, uh, and we like to think of, of being smart uh, is normal, uh, but, but most animals are dumb and, and have very few brain cells. Uh, but like I showed you with that sea slug, 5,000 brain cells is enough to do the basics, right? Find mates, 
uh, find food, avoid predators. Uh, so you don't really need that many brain cells, but for humans and human society, we need those 100 billion brain cells to run this complicated society we have. Anyway, I think it's a fun question. Cool. Can I, can I show something? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a little bit of, of this. Uh, so I was mentioning before that I've got a little uh, slice of brain here on a, uh, on a slide, get that in focus. Uh, this is a slice of, uh, yes, it says human cerebellum. Uh, cerebellum is that little bitty uh, part on the back of your brain. Uh, it only takes up maybe a, a fifth or so of your total brain. But what's weird is there are more brain cells in that little chunk in the back of your head than there is in the whole rest of your brain. Uh, in other words, your cerebellum is the densest part of your brain. Uh, and so some of that density is what you're seeing there, all these little black dots. And so I'll zoom in here a little bit, see if we can get a closer look at those black dots, get myself focused again. Boom, 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 boom. There we are. Uh, so each one of those black dots uh, is the cell body of a brain cell. And you can tell that that, that central area there is super dense in cells. And so I can even go another degree of magnification and refocus again. Yeah, each one of those little dots is an individual brain cell. So you can see some small brain cells, the granular cells there in the center. Um, you can see the, oh, you can't see that diagram. And then there's a, a larger brain cell over here. Uh, these larger brain cells are um, so-called Purkinje cells. These are um, some of the most complicated brain cells in your brain. The cerebellum helps you to um, uh, coordinate and, and learn so-called muscle memory, right? So you, you might know how to do some things without thinking about them, like feed yourself and stuff like that. You don't have to think about it. You just sort of know how, how to get the fork to your mouth or even keeping your eyes closed. Uh, that's learned uh, by your cerebellum. And these cerebellar cells, like I said, the human brain has about 100 billion brain cells, many of most of which are in your cerebellum. And each one of those brain cells has to communicate with thousands of others, on average, about a thousand others. But this brain cell that I'm showing up here at the upper right, that brain cell more likely gets 100,000 or even a million inputs to that single cell. Uh, and so these are some of the most complicated brain cells in our whole brain. Uh, and, and people spend their entire careers trying to understand how this kind of cell works. Um, and then over here on the left side, you can see sort of some fibers going uh, up and down. Uh, those are the uh, fibers of passage that send signals, the axons. Uh, and your brain is approximately 60% myelin, myelinated axons. So it's only 40% actual brain cells. The rest of that 60% is wiring, connecting the brain cells to one another. So your, your brain is like 60% just wiring. Um, and, and so like I said, it's, it's, it's an incredibly complicated uh, structure uh, with, uh, uh, like I said, 100 billion brain cells each connected to a thousand others. So if you imagine just getting down on a piece of paper and writing out a hundred billion dots, and then for each one of those dots, connecting it to a thousand other dots, right? It would take you a century just to draw that out. Um, and, and so we are really excited about studying the brain, but, but um, we're probably not gonna figure it out for another century or 10. Um, it's, it's a complicated mess, which is why I love studying those sea slugs. It's much more satisfying. But we also know that human brain cells or human brains can go wrong in so many ways, right? There's so many mental disorders and, and brain diseases. Uh, and, and so people are probably familiar with Alzheimer's disease uh, that uh, interferes with the communication between these brain cells uh, and then people can lose their memories. Uh, and so it's, uh, 
it's, it's a very tragic disease and we're trying to make some progress uh, on that. I also wanted to show you uh, a little bit of my sea slug brain cells uh, and how, uh, oops, where have I gone? Let's see if I can find them again. Oh, there they are. Okay, I wanted to show you a little bit of my sea slug brain cells uh, to show you how I study them uh, using a three-dimensional microscope. Okie dokie, right? And, and so uh, I have this three-dimensional microscope and it's kind of like an MRI, uh, magnetic resonance imager, but for microscopic stuff. Uh, and so uh, I got a scale bar on here somewhere. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't s see it here. Oh yeah, right up here. Uh, image size, uh, view size. Uh, yeah, so that's this this uh, ganglion that you're seeing here is about a millimeter wide, uh, and like I said, these have these four brain cells in it that I injected with a uh, fluorescent chemical, um, and what you're seeing now is looking at the different two-dimensional images I've taken uh, in sequence as you go deeper into the brain and you're seeing axons and dendrites and then the cell body starts to become lighter. But you can see that huge network of complex uh, axons here that are all interacting with one another. Uh, this ganglion here has about a uh, hundred or maybe as many as a thousand brain cells and they're all communicating through axons and dendrites. Uh, and so my microscope is able to take these two-dimensional images in sequence and then assemble them into a three-dimensional whole. Uh, so the microscope that I have is called a uh, confocal microscope. And uh, I can show you another little image here. Okay, so the red dot, the red circles and the green circles are cell bodies. Uh, and then the, all the little red fibers are axons, green and red fibers are axons. Um, and so what you're seeing is a bit of nervous tissue from a sea slug that's been stained for two different neurotransmitters. One, a peptide neurotransmitter uh, called pedal peptide, oops, we've got problems. And, uh, and the green one is serotonin. So serotonin is found in all sorts of species, pretty, pretty much all of them, all animals. Uh, and this shows you that they are segregated. Some neurons have peptide neurotransmitters, some have uh, uh, serotonin, uh, and they're separated in this species, and they're separated quite a bit in our species as well. Um, but it gives you an idea of how complicated that whole uh, mess is. And if I pause it here, uh, I do have scale on here. Um, this goes from zero to 250 microns. So this little space here is one quarter of a millimeter wide. And then you can see all the hundreds and thousands of axons in that little quarter millimeter square, right? So this is describing the complexity of the brain of a dumb sea slug. Uh, and then just imagine extrapolating that out from 5,000 brain cells up to 100 billion brain cells. Uh, you know, the human brain is just uh, an astonishingly complicated thing. Uh, but this is more uh, brain tissue from my sea slug, uh, again, showing a three-dimensional slice, uh, showing uh, the peptide neurotransmitter and the um, uh, serotonin. Uh, and then you can see there's lots of nothing there as well. That so-called nothing is also filled with brain tissue uh, just using a different neurotransmitter. So you see the peptide and the serotonin and everything else in there that's clear is also full of brain cells that are using a different neurotransmitter. And, and sea slugs have hundreds and humans have hundreds of different neurotransmitters uh, they use in their brain. Any questions there in the chat? So yeah, this uh, microscope is called a confocal microscope uh, and it uses lasers and special optics uh, to take images that are always in focus, uh, but can only take uh, one in focus image at a time 
and then it'll move the microscope to take hundreds or thousands of in focus images and assemble them into this three-dimensional uh, map of the nervous system of a sea slug. I also have a little bit of kidney here if anybody likes kidneys. Um, this is a, a chunk of, of kidney tissue and uh, if anybody knows anything about kidneys, uh, kidneys have uh, tubules in them that they use to make urine. Oops, stopped it. Uh, that they use to make urine. They have blood vessels in there that feed those tubules blood so they can filter the blood. Uh, and then all these little blue dots here uh, is uh, labeled with a specific dye just for DNA. Okay, um, let, me, uh, let me stop talking for a moment and see if uh, Ms. Yadigari wants to say anything because we've got three minutes. Oh no, I'm good. Okay. I've said everything. Is there <laughs> any other questions? Are there any, are there any other guests? Let me, let me show you one more thing if, if, um, if there are no other questions and if there are in fact guests still out there in the area of science festival. Yeah, there are people out there, I see people. Okay, I'm gonna try to show, oh yeah, let me, let me show you this just a second here. Switch over to a different microscope slide. This is an actual uh, spinal cord. Let me uh, see if I can fix the illumination a little bit here. Um, this is a spinal cord and I'll show you a little bit of white matter and a little bit of gray matter. Okay, get that focused, right? So this is the little butterfly-like cross section uh, of a uh, spinal cord. I think this is a rodent. Um, and, uh, and so the butterfly in the center is made up of gray matter, mostly brain cells and dendrites. Uh, and then this out part, outer part here that's kind of redder is made out of white matter. And so I said the human brain is 60% white matter and only 40% gray matter. Uh, and so that's true here of the uh, spinal cord as well. Um, and this butterfly shape, the two top parts of the butterfly are receiving sensory information from the body. And then the bottom parts of the butterfly are sending out uh, uh, signals to control the muscles. And if we quickly zoom on in there, we might be able to show you one of those uh, cells. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah, and we get that focused. Yeah, so these are large motor neurons that are receiving input from hundreds of other neurons and sending output through uh, from the spinal cord to the muscles. So two minutes left. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, or, or I'll just keep showing slides. <laughs> anyway, I do want to encourage you guys to uh, sign up for the Bay Area Brain Bee. Even if we don't have a Brain Bee, we're going to have something and it's going to be fun. Uh, so uh, uh, go, go look at Bay Area Brain Bee, Google that, and, uh, and go ahead and sign up. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll fix that website so it accepts uh, your entries uh, uh, later today. Let's see. Can we do anything else before we sign off? Okay. Okay. Cool. See you guys. Adios. Have fun. Bye, everyone. <laughs>